Good afternoon. Let me begin by saying, first of all, how proud of you I am as a church family. Many of you have been meeting together with Zoom or some other way and talking together. I've talked to every single one of you at some point or another. It is encouraging to see how we as a church have stuck together with each other, uh, centered under Christ, with Him as the focus of our lives. So I just want to say, as your pastor, you guys are doing a great job. And I'm so very, very proud of you. It'll be interesting to see in the days and weeks ahead how we are able to begin meeting together. I will tell you that our plan has been to try to meet starting the first Sunday of June. But I'll also tell you that the word on when we meet will be disseminated through your deacons. And so you'll be hearing from them specifically. 
As of this moment, our target is still try to meet the first Sunday of June, but we'll see how that goes. In the meantime, I'm glad to hear that all of you have been safe and protected from this virus and that uh, you have found encouragement to go on day by day, drawing strength from the Lord himself. So as we begin today, let's begin with prayer. Father, I'm grateful that you have brought us thus far. I thank you, Father, for the encouragement that we can draw from one another as we all follow Christ, as we all encourage each other and love one another, Father, through these times. Now, Lord, I pray that you will bear us up. And today, especially, Lord, I'm asking that you will teach us from your word. Help us to draw our life itself, Father, through your word from your Son, Jesus Christ. Nourish our souls, Father, with your word, because your word is truth. Lord, I thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles there with you, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to begin today in verse 10. But first, just a word of sort of preparation. We began the book of Ephesians with Paul talking about where we came from. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins, but God has quickened us. He has made us alive in Jesus Christ. This wasn't as a result of anything we did. It's by God's grace through faith we have been saved. He goes on to talk about the preeminent nature and person of Jesus Christ and importance to us as our glorious Lord and Savior. And then he goes on to talk about how we are a church. Now that's every believer in Christ, but in the local sense here at Ferris Baptist Fellowship, we are in Christ and together we are the body of Christ in this local area. So he talked about what that was like. And it's all important to him that we be one because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. And it is important for us to, to cling to that and to realize that the highest good that we face is to bring glory to God for sure. But right behind it is that we be unified in our desire and our quest for that to be true. And so all the way through the book of Ephesians, God's been relating who we are, how we came to be, how we are conduct, to conduct ourselves in the body, how we are conduct ourselves in the world. And he has finished this last section talking about submission, how we are to submit to one another uh, out of reverence for Christ. And so we have finished that section, but we haven't finished the teaching yet in the book of Ephesians. And so when we come to chapter 6, verse 10, Paul's going to use a word that we often like preachers to use, finally. And so that brings us to an end of this teaching. But we want to be, pay careful attention here because when Paul is summing up this teaching in the book of Ephesians, it's a sprint to the finish line, and there's much in this last few verses, in these last few verses in chapter 6. I don't want to miss them. And so we may go longer in uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, than just today. We'll see how it goes. So pick up your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18 or in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. <clears throat> that is to say, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fa fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now that ends our reading for today. In fact, that actually is the end of these thoughts that he has. I remind you that the Bible was not written in verses and chapters. I mean, it was written in sentences and paragraphs. And so we come to this place in the paragraph, which is a stopping point, because the next words in chapter 18 are going to be to that end. And so there's a reason why we're going to do all of this, uh, and especially as we end up in prayer. So we begin today considering the, uh, the, the art of Christian warfare. 
Uh, Sun Tzu, who probably is the most quoted authority on war, said, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Now actually, those are sage words. Because what Paul is addressing our attention to in this chapter is, we need to know who we are. That's what he's been talking about through this whole book. And we need to know who the enemy is. And so he's going to talk about the kind of warfare that we have, who, who are the opposition forces, and then what our resources are as we stand in that battle. I need to remind you that in every war we have casualties. Those are in terms of fatalities and injuries. It is a goal of the Christian life that we be neither in the sense, in the spiritual sense of the term. And I remind you that we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare today, not armed hand-to-hand, -hand, armed arm combat out in the field of battle in the physical world. The spiritual world impacts the physical world, yea, verily it drives the physical world. But we're talking here about spiritual warfare. Now, then the second thing about war that you need to know is that every war is, stands on some pillars. And some of those pillars include command. You have to know who's in charge. What is the command authority? And then secondly, there is control. Uh, what's the lines of discipline? What, what's the rank and order? What, who do we relate to? Who do we report to? Who gives the orders and who doesn't? And how is that given up and down the chain of command? And then there is power projection because ultimately, even though command and control are important, uh, even though a great war plan is important, until power projection is accomplished, you haven't really done one single thing about the war. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about command, control, and power projection. How in the world do we as Christians stand in the day of battle? So you need to know this is a personal, spiritual conflict. In other words, the individual members of the church put on the armor of God. The whole church doesn't put on the armor of God. So it's easy to see here that there's an army made up of individuals. And so what Paul is going to do is he's going to equip the individuals in the army uh, on preparation for going into battle. Then you need to know that in this personal spiritual conflict, there is a reality. And it is a certain reality. And the end result of that is God wins. Now the goal is that we be on his side. You see, I think it's kind of erroneous. You know, we're always talking about if God is on our side, we'll win. Well, mm, that's kind of bad thinking. Actually, we need to get on God's side because he's always going to win. So we're going to look at spiritual warfare and at the personal spiritual conflict that's occurring as we stand in the army of the Lord. So Paul brings us, first of all, to, the, to relying on God's strength and God's strategy. If we're talking about command and control here, you need to know that God's the one who's in command and God's the one who's got control and he's got certainly power and he's got a strategy on how to win. And so in verses 10 through 11, Paul tells us that we are to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then, then therefore we are to put on the whole armor of God. So, so, so often we're overcome with a feeling of powerlessness. You know, much of powerlessness, if not all, comes from not using what God has provided. You know, we think we're big and bad and tough until something really powerful comes along and all of a sudden we got no answers. Well, we have the same answers we had all along. It's just a question of, are we using what God has given us to use? Or are we faking it and baking it as we move on in our own strength? The command in verse 10 here is to be strong, and that's an interesting choice of words because it is the Greek word endunamo, which means, you know, it takes dunamas, sort of a power word, and it adds to it a prefix end, and that is means to become able to function or do something, to become strong. So endunamo means to become strong, but not just in anything, in the Lord. Uh, and in his mighty, and that word mighty here is the word kratos. That's an ability to exhibit or ex express resident strength. In other words, it's like the projection of power. And so as we move through this language of this, what we are told is that 
We are to move in the Lord's strength, not only in His power, but also move in the way that the Lord has told us to move. You know, Paul himself was afflicted with some kind of thorn in the flesh. Uh, most of us believe, I think, that it is his eyesight that is failing because he wrote to the church at Galatia and he said, well, see with what big letters I am signing my name. And so we know that Paul's eyesight was failing uh, on toward the end of his life, and I believe that's what the thorn in the flesh was, but we don't actually know. But it was called a messenger of Satan to torment him. Paul didn't sanctify his illness, even though God was using this evil thing. He asked for God to remove it, but God denied him his request and said, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. God used evil once again for good, Romans 8, 28. So, so Paul would remain humble. That's the point. God allowed this affliction in Paul's life so that he could be humble because when he was humble, God was strong, God was powerful. Now that, that tells you something about the terms of this warfare. You see, we have an earthly, physical, temporal view of warfare. The one who has the biggest guns is going to win. The one who's got the most people can win. You know, the ones that can back up their claims, you can win. All those things are erroneous because they're not true. Oh, it may look true in the physical sense, but actually the physical sense is not really what this is all about. What this is really all about is where is your eternal soul? What impacts and affects your eternal soul? That's what's important about warfare. Uh, Martin Luther said it, the body they may kill. <laughs> God's truth abides still. You see, it's not about whether or not the body can be taken. Jesus said, don't worry about the one that can kill the body, but worry about the one that having killed the body can take the soul and banish it off to hell. You see, the point here is that we have to be relying on God's power and God's strength and God's strategy because those are the things that affect our eternal soul. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul described himself and what his life was like. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Can you hear in Paul's voice there? The idea that God used him in the midst of all kinds of personal struggles and afflictions. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if all you look at is whether or not you're living a comfortable life as an indicator of whether God's blessing you or using you, you've missed it altogether. Because God's taken his finest servants often and crushed them. Why? So that God might be glorified. So that God might be the one who is seen as having preserved the soul. To the Philippian church, Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 12, and 13, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So the secret here is to be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Paul likens it to armor or armament of a soldier, perhaps using one of the prison guards as an example. You know, Paul was under house arrest when he wrote this book to Ephesians. And so he would have had a Roman guard there. And most people believe that he was looking at this Roman guard and making the comparisons about how we are to become soldiers, good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what are some of the tactics and weapons of the enemy? Well, Paul tells us in chapter 6, verse 11, the second half, and verse 12. He says to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he tells us something very important. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Most of us here in the Western cultures grew up with a scientific materialistic mindset. If you can't see it or touch it or measure it in a scientific manner, then it's not real. In fact, haven't you noticed during this virus pandemic we've been in, science is being sold as the answer to all of it. If science doesn't save us, we're all lost. We're all going to die. Well, my friends, that's not true. 
You know, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. It's an appointment. You know, God's not, you can't sneak up on death. From God's point of view, all your days were numbered before you lived to one of them. Now, I'm not saying that you should live recklessly. In fact, I just need to add here that you should be smart and do what the authorities are telling you to do about wearing your mask and washing your hands all the time and not touching your eyes, your nose, your face, and certainly nobody else is either. But, you know, it's important that during these times we realize that God is the answer. Science is not the answer. Uh, even though man has seen microscopic things even further down than we've ever seen before and seen things out there further away than we've ever seen before, that doesn't mean man's in control of them. <laughs> that doesn't mean that at all. But God is. So <clears throat> at the very moment, by the way, that, that I'm sitting here, all through this house, in fact, probably penetrating through my body, are all kinds of waves and signals. Television signals, radio waves, microwaves, you know, all kinds of things are going on. You can't see them and hear them unless you turn on a listening or a viewing device. Spiritual beings are the same way. While we can't see spiritual beings, we can sense them so long as we have our antenna up to be able to do so. I believe in Jesus, people have said, but I don't believe in Satan and demons. That's interesting, since Jesus had a great deal to say about both. That kind of in-your-face ignorance is like a blind man denying the existence of a streetlight. Well, in case you didn't know, Paul's a, Paul gives us some uh, nature of the spiritual struggle that we're facing. In uh, cha uh, chapter 6, verse, uh, second half of verse 11 through 13, he talks about the devil's schemes. So we see there's an arch enemy here. The devil has schemes. He's the one that's organizing the opposition. And it's not flesh and blood. No man is our enemy. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. But he goes on to talk about who our enemy is. They're rulers and authorities. They're powers of this dark world. They're spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Now that's important to note because when Satan was cast out of heaven, a third of the angels were cast out with him. And you know, I don't even pretend to know all that's involved in that because God didn't choose to reveal to us a whole lot about that just to show us how evil forces came to be. The head evil guy, Lucifer was his name, who became the devil and Satan. Lucifer was abandoned from heaven, was given to banish from heaven because he decided he wanted to ascend to the hill of the Most High God. He wanted to be God. He thought he rightfully deserved to be God. He was the most exalted cherub. I believe that he was beautiful, that he was resplendent. Uh, but he was a created being. Now, we were doing all right as human beings until we sided with Satan in the Garden of Eden. And that cast a pall and a dark light on the rest of mankind. And it put us in a place where Paul also says that we're living in an evil day. Because evil has inhabited this planet and it's everywhere. And we would call that, partly, the world system. There's a way the world does business and it's an evil way. Now, some of the words that are used here, devil translates the word diabolos. Uh, that's where we get the word diabolical, by the way, and where we get the word devil. Uh, then there are rulers and principalities. That's translated from the Greek word arche, which, from which we get the word archbishop, uh, which means ruler or authority or official. It can be used of good rulers as well as bad. The idea here is that some of the rulers in the spiritual realm are demonic in their allegiance, we believe, though the scripture is pretty silent on this, that Satan once himself was this anointed cherub, which the Bible uses as a term, who, as I said, rose up against God, and angels uh, that, that sided with him became demons, and these powers and principalities that exist in the spiritual realm. We see a hint of this in Daniel chapter 10, which we studied in verses 12 through 13 and verse 20, where Daniel relates an experience in which Michael the archangel was delayed in answering da Daniel's prayer because of a battle with the prince of the Persian kingdom. I believe spiritual rulers seek to control and influence neighborhoods, cities, regions, and countries. And then there are these authorities that are mentioned. That translates the, the, a plural of the Greek word exousia, which is a ge generic word meaning the right to control or command authority, absolute authority, or warrant. So we're faced with the powers of this world. 
the, the cosmos, uh, the cosmocrator, which means world ruler. So there are rulers in this world that are backed by spiritual rulers in a spiritual kingdom. Well, what's our goal here? Well, what our goal is to stand, and that's verse 13. Our problem is that we don't see the spiritual realm and we often misunderstand the nature of the life and death struggle in which we as humans are engaged. It's easy to focus on people as evil. Right now, in Minneapolis, there's a whole lot of bad things going on which sprang forth from one bad thing which went on. And, and it's unfortunate because what happens according to the doctrine of the total depravity of man is that mankind is capable of any kind of evil at any time. Well, you say, well, people don't do that normally. No, people don't do that normally. But every once in a while, when something happens in the hum human community, Satan fans up you know, evil in people, and you see bad things happen, like you see burning and looting. And that was all precipitated by a really bad thing happening, police killing someone who didn't deserve to die. Well, our struggle is real, but it's not against flesh and blood. And one of the problems we have in the world is seeing that. It's just too easy to fixate our problems, fixate our, our fleshly feelings on somebody that's flesh and blood because they're standing right in front of us. And you felt that as much as I have, just driving down the highway. You know, this term called road rage has appeared, uh, and it's easy to see how that can happen, but... Flesh and blood's not the enemy, neither is the 1992 Chevrolet that cuts you off. The real enemy there is Satan. So we are told in verse 13 to take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. So what is victory? You know, how do we know we're winning? How do we know that, that doing all this is going to result in the outcome that we're going to be involved in defeating Satan and the gates of hell? Are we supposed to just lash on the armor and storm the gates of hell and impose our will on the, these uh, do-batters in the spiritual kingdom? Well, no. Because that's not following our Lord and His plan. I mean, in a word... You see, when you start feeling those fleshly impulses that you want to storm the gates of hell or you want to lash out at Satan or you want to do something else like that, you're outside God's will. God is revealing his will of what we are to do in warfare in this chapter. If Satan can discourage us or wear us down, we may fall, we may retreat, we may give up. But victory is to stand. It's to remain. It's a matter of Who's left standing at the end of the day? Well, I don't have to tell you that. Historically, whoever's standing in the battlefield is the one who won. I don't care how many corpses you count. The one that's standing at the end, that's the one that wins. Well, that's the way it is in the spiritual kingdom too. We are told that we are to stand, and God, our commander-in-chief, has given the instructions. Jesus said it like this, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So beginning in verse 14, he goes through the armament. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to save this for next week. Because I want to go through every piece of this and show you how every single piece of this applied says something important about your relationship with the Lord. It says something about your involvement in the battle. It says something about your influence in the world. All these pieces, they make sense in the context of God, our imperious, furious, uh, uh, feared leader, moving us into battle, claiming the victory through Christ. Now, I need to tell you, you know the end of the story, Christ already won. But there's a battle that has to be played out. Why? Because it's in the plan of God. God is going to show himself victorious to the uttermost. There will be not a single voice opposing God at the end of this story. Not Satan, not the Antichrist, not the false prophet, not the nations of the earth. Everyone will bow down and confess that Jesus is Lord, and that to the glory of the Father. So, from today, let me give you three quick applications. First, recognize that you're in a war. Being passive, indifferent, and ignorant will have devastating effects on your life. you got to wake up and realize that you're in a war. You say, well, I didn't choose to get in this war. I want to be a pacifist. You don't get to be that. You can't be Switzerland in this war. No, 
Nobody gets a pass. We're in it. So you need to first of all recognize that you're in it and stop being passive, stop being indifferent, stop being ignorant of the battle. There's no plausible deniability here. You don't get to say, well, I didn't know. Well, yeah, you do. Secondly, you're not an innocent. You know, a lot of times we talk about warfare. They were innocent. You know, they were, no, you're not an innocent. In fact, you're the target. Satan has you in his crosshairs because you have robbed him of his most precious possession, specialness. <laughs> Do you hear what I said? You see, Satan thought he was special. Until man was created in the image of God, he was the highest of God's creation. He is furious, I believe, that God has set his favor upon man and crowned him with glory. Look at Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8, or Psalm 144, verses 3 and 4. Satan is furious that man interrupted his, his march toward glory himself. And you know that battle in the little battle that happened there in the Garden of Eden where God condemned the serpent to crawl on his belly all his days and cursed the serpent, that was not incidental contact. That was a big salvo. Third thing is, this is not guerrilla warfare, nor is it some underground reaction to a superior force. We are involved in a well-organized campaign for the souls of men. We fight as a well-trained, disciplined army of individuals who follow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are the superior force. It may not look like it, but it is so. And I tell you that on authority of the Word of God. Trust our God and King to lead us on victorious in battle for His glory and for the souls of men. That's my prayer this week. Get into Ephesians chapter 6. Read verses 10 through 18 and beyond. And join me next Sunday when we'll finish this section talking about the whole armor of God. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, help us as we take up this glorious task of being conformed into the image of Christ, of following in the steps of Christ himself, Lord. Give us grace and mercy this week to live our lives for your glory in such a way that will honor you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a good day.